In the previous episode, we started the process of adding sensors to the 719cc supercharged diesel Honda Insight. The purpose of these sensors is so we can use an Arduino microcomputer to manage the boost of the supercharger and to control how much the fuel rack inside the mechanical fuel injection pump will move. Managing the fuel rack movement is a necessary evil because this engine is equipped with a mechanical governor and the fuel rack is controlled by the governor and is not directly connected to the accelerator pedal. Today, we're going to live test the sensors and the gizmos on the car with the engine running and we're going to install one more sensor. And this one is to measure the vehicle speed. So let's get started. As most of you folks know, this is a weekly video series, and a lot can happen in seven days. And unfortunately, sometimes very little can happen. Well, let me rephrase that. A lot of progress can be made with very little to show. So what that means is sometimes maximum effort yields significant but meh results. So in the previous episode, I showed how the frequency the voltage converter worked for measuring the engine RPM, and it was a few RPMs off, but basically it was in the ballpark, which is good enough for this project. Now if you did see the previous episode, you may remember that we used the frequency generator to simulate the signal the crank position sensor would normally send. We did this because the crankshaft position sensor was not installed on the engine yet. So let's go ahead and install the crankshaft position sensor and verify this method of measuring engine RPM will actually work. So this is the crankshaft pulley that we modified in the previous video. Basically, we just drilled some holes in it and then JB welded some magnets to the pulley. Now each of these magnets have the south pole facing out and that's so I can use a Hall Effect proximity sensor to detect the magnets when the pulley's spinning. You know, one magnet would have been enough and there's really no set rule as to how many magnets are needed for measuring RPM. I chose three magnets because the frequency generated by the three magnets was in the operating range of the frequency to voltage converter. You see, the frequency to voltage converter that I'm using has an operating range from 0 to 200 hertz. So when you do the math, at 4000 RPM, which is the fastest this engine can spin, the frequency of the three magnets will generate about, uh, I don't know, a 200 hertz signal. Now I've since discovered that the closer you get to the maximum limit of these frequency to voltage converters, the output will actually get a bit flaky. And in reality, a 200 hertz converter is really only good for about 150 hertz. So that's something to keep in mind if you're considering fooling around with one of these things. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to replace the 200 hertz module with a 500 hertz module so I can get the full range. Anyway, this is the Hall Effect sensor and we'll need to figure out a way to mount it, which shouldn't be too hard. Well, fast forward a few minutes and the best way I found to mount this sensor was to weld a tab onto the motor mount brace. Now, due to the vibrations this engine develops, I went ahead and used a fairly thick piece of steel for the tab. The last thing I want is any flex in the mounting system that may cause the sensor to read incorrectly. I also added a few clamps to keep the cable from getting snagged on the various things that can snag cables. Let's install this and see if it works. Well, there it is, all bolted in place. From the top, we can see that there's a small gap between the sensor and the crank pulley. Now, the way everything is braced on this motor mount system, I don't expect any problems with the sensor coming in contact with the pulley. The frequency to voltage converter is housed in this 3D printed enclosure that I mounted under the hood. The sensor connects to the box with this mini screw terminal connector, and the output of the converter connects to the Arduino via this temporary Wago style connector. Now, before I start the engine, Let's verify the sensor can detect the magnet. Now keep your eyes on the sensor. As I rotate the engine, the sensor should glow red when it detects the magnet. Yup, it sure does. Okay, let's try that again with the engine running. Now on camera, you do see a bit of flashing and that's an effect caused by the camera, so no worries. Now as I recall, this engine idles at about 1100 RPM Let's see what the Arduino is saying. Hmm, well that's close enough for now. I'll have to double check this with the oscilloscope later to verify the signal from the sensor translates correctly, but so far so good. All right, well, let's see what kind of trouble we can get into with the vehicle speed sensor. So in case you didn't know, this diesel powered Frankenstein Honda uses a Saturn S series close ratio five speed transmission. 
The vehicle speed sensor on this gearbox is this guy. It's a VR type sensor or variable reluctance. Meh, these are difficult to interface with because of the signal they generate, but let's see what we can do. So this is a picture of a Saturn differential carrier that's inside the transmission we just looked at. My best guess is the speed sensor is counting these nubs here, and if I'm correct, the sensor would likely work like this and count the nubs as the differential carrier rotated. Now on this carrier, I was able to determine that it has 16 nubs, so what that means is, every time the wheel rotates one revolution, we would get 16 pulses from the sensor. If we factor in the size of the tires on the Honda, mathematically this carrier would rotate 899 times in one mile. Blah, blah, blah. The bottom line is we can figure out and calibrate our software with math, so that's the easy part. The hard part's going to be interfacing this sensor. You see, a VR type sensor generates an AC sine wave, and what that means is the voltage above this line is positive and the voltage below this line is negative. I reckon if we add a diode to the output on this side of the sensor and ground to the other side, well, the output of the sensor would now look like this. If we did that, the good news is our signal is now all positive pulses, which is a great starting point. The next problem is, the voltage of these pulses at slow speeds is usually around 2 volts, which is too low, and we need to amplify it because our frequency to voltage converter needs at least a 12 volt pulse to operate correctly. Okay, well, this is all theory. Let's do an experiment to confirm what I'm saying is true. So I have the car up on jack stands, and the wires for the vehicle speed sensor have been extended so they reach the oscilloscope. Let's look at the raw signal from the sensor. Yep, the signal from the VR sensor is definitely a sine wave. It's not a perfect sine wave like I expected, but it's a sine wave nonetheless. Let's see what happens if I block half the signal with a diode. Alright, now we're making some progress. The modified signal is now showing positive pulses, and it looks like the voltage is a little bit less than 2 volts. Now here's the problem. My stash of transistors has gone AWOL, and I don't have a clean way of amplifying this signal. Hmm... Okay, well I'm not proud of this, but it works. I'm using half of an H-bridge driver to amplify the signal. I have some other stuff ordered, but they won't be here for a few days. So let's at least get something working so I can write the software needed to convert this signal into vehicle speed. Fast forward a few minutes and the car's running again, and the transmission's in first gear. Looks like now we have a perfect square wave, and according to the settings on the oscilloscope, this is a 12 volt signal, which is exactly what we needed. You see, this frequency converter needs at least a 12 volt pulse signal, so it can generate a 0 to 5 volt analog signal that the Arduino can measure. Let's take a look at what the Arduino is seeing. Okay, well, the car is still in first gear. Now, if my math is correct, the Arduino should be showing 5 miles per hour. And, well, we're close. It really should be closer to 6 miles per hour given that the engine's idling at 1100 RPM. Let's try second gear. Yeah, it's still a little low, but it's working. Now let's try third gear. Yep, it's still reading low. Now I'm not too worried right now. I have to go back and replace the amplifier with something <laughs> a bit more conventional. And I have to replace the frequency to voltage converter with something that's rated at a higher frequency. I think the one that I'm using will only work up to 20 miles per hour, and this car can go a lot faster than that. So right now, all this stuff is a hot mess, but it's working to some degree. I say we put the car back on the ground and try some fuel rack experiments. Wow, it's been a short while since I sat in this seat. Now, at this point, I still haven't written any software to link the sensors to the rack controller and the boost controller, so we'll still be using the handheld interface. Now, everything is actually made to run off 12 volts, but for now I'm using a small 12 volt battery. This little battery has enough juice to operate all the gizmos for quite a while. Now, the reason I haven't connected this system directly to the car's electrical system is, I want to avoid running the computer off dirty power. You see, with all the relays and solenoids switching on and off, well, it sends spikes into the electrical system, and I'll have to install a clean power filter at some point. Okay, the battery's connected. Let me turn the system on. 
Now if you watch the boost gauge, the boost will bump up for a moment and that's the boost controller self calibrating. The rack controller self calibrates as well, but that's not something we can actually see. So if I turn the boost controller knob clockwise, you can see I have full control of the boost. I think I've shown this a few times already. Let's take a look at the rack controller knob. If I spin the knob counterclockwise to zero, the rack limiter will extend and completely block the rack from moving when I press down on the accelerator. Now my foot is still pressing down on the accelerator, but it's not until I turn the knob clockwise the engine will respond. Now at this point, the throttle response is a bit sluggish. So if I continue keeping the accelerator pressed down, I can actually rev the engine just by turning this knob. Pretty neat. Okay, let's set the rack knob here and then add a little boost. Now, normally the Arduino will automatically adjust the rack and the boost based on throttle position, engine RPM, and vehicle speed. But as I mentioned, I haven't written that part of the code yet. The purpose of all this junk is to eliminate the puff of smoke we get under a light to medium acceleration. This is so we can drive the car into big city without upsetting the civilian population. So we're going to try a few settings and see how that affects the exhaust. So right away we can see that the diesel engine's behaving and I'm able to stop the engine from emitting a puff of smoke when I let out the clutch and start accelerating. Theoretically, the Arduino would automatically increase the boost while limiting the fuel, then gradually back off on the fuel rack limiter. That way the engine can efficiently process the fuel without generating any smoke. Yeah, it's a little sluggish right now, but both the fuel rack and the boost aren't being actively controlled. I'm going to go ahead and call this first test a success, and now I can move forward with the rest of the software. Okay, so this time around, I'm going to set the rack to turtle mode, and as soon as the car starts moving, I'll twist the knob to rabbit mode. This is to see how fast the rack controller can react in the event we need instant full power. Not too shabby. Now, I'm sure you noticed the exhaust was a bit dirty, but keep in mind that's what happens when you ask a tiny diesel engine to go full tilt. For safety reasons, we need access to all the power that this engine can generate at a moment's notice. Well, I reckon I have enough sensors in place so I can go ahead and write some code to automatically control everything. I think with the Arduino in command, the exhaust should be a bit cleaner than what I showed in this quick test. Both the rack limiter and the boost controller need to work in a coordinated effort, which is not possible with the handheld interface. Now, if you made it this far in the video, thanks for sticking around, and I'll see you next time. Until then. Is there anyone still watching? Okay, it looks like there is a few people. Anyway, there was a segment in this video that got edited out because it was, well, quite frankly, boring and redundant, and I didn't want the audience to suffer as I rambled on about electronics and software. Now, for those of you folks who managed to get this far in the video, well, you asked for it, and now you have to suffer through some of my ramblings.
Measuring the frequency of the engine RPM and the vehicle speed sensor, which is a significant part of this project, is actually somewhat difficult for the Arduino microcomputer to do. Here, let me explain. This is a typical square wave signal, and as you can see, the waveform goes up and down, and the signal sort of resembles a bunch of squares, hence the name square wave. Now, there are many different types and shapes of signals that a car can generate, but typically you'll encounter square wave or sine wave. Anyway, on the square wave signal, in order to calculate the frequency of the signal, the microcomputer needs to know how much time it takes to complete one cycle of the square wave. So at this point, when the signal transitions from low to high, this is the starting point of the cycle. Now, if this signal was connected to the port on the microcomputer, at this exact moment when the signal goes from low to high, it triggers what is known as an interrupt request. This interrupt is a hardware-software interface, and when it's triggered, it halts whatever the microprocessor was doing, and now the microprocessor has to deal with a new set of instructions in the code that must be done in the event of an interrupt. Now in our case, all the microprocessor has to do is start a timer, and then it can go back to doing whatever it was doing. This interrupt thing seems like a very rude way of getting stuff done, but it's completely normal. Now, when the signal transitions from high to low, once again it triggers a very rude interrupt request, and the microprocessor stops what it was doing and executes a new set of instructions. This time, the microprocessor is going to stop the timer, then record how long the signal was high, then it will restart the timer and start measuring how long the signal will remain low. And boom, the signal goes high again. And you guessed it, it triggered another interrupt request. So the microprocessor has to stop whatever it was doing and deal with this new interrupt. And it will stop the timer and record how long the signal stayed low. The good news is, after one complete cycle, now the microprocessor has enough information to calculate the frequency. And according to the data it collected, it may say the frequency is somewhere around 100 hertz or 100 times per second. As you can see, interrupts can be very handy despite being a rude way to get things done. Garçon, coffee! Now keep in mind, as long as the signal oscillates from high to low, it will continue to interrupt the microprocessor every few milliseconds and demand that the microprocessor start and stop the timers and record how much time it takes for each event. It sounds exhausting if you ask me, but it's all good. The Arduino microcomputer itself, well, it has plenty of resources to deal with these interrupts, but unfortunately the instruction code that's available in the programming environment isn't very good at measuring frequencies. And measuring frequencies is something that the Arduino can't do efficiently. Now, keep in mind, the hardware is capable, it's just a limitation in the standard software. The workaround is to use advanced code techniques, which is not really documented and therefore difficult to do. So in our project, we need to measure the frequency of the engine RPM and the frequency generated by the vehicle speed sensor. Now, measuring both of these frequencies directly with the Arduino and using standard programming code would dramatically slow the Arduino down. So instead of using advanced programming techniques, we're going to cheat and use a frequency to voltage converter. This device converts the frequency into an analog voltage, and analog voltages are something the Arduino can process very quickly. This frequency to voltage gizmo is a different approach to solving the frequency measurement issue, and it provides an off-the-shelf solution for measuring frequencies, but it isn't as precise as direct frequency measurements. And that's it. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time.